What's up everyone, Alex here. So I've been playing a ton of Dragon's Dogma True recently, and I'm just having a blast. And while I'm not ready to talk about the journeys of Daenerys Targaryen and Mads Mikkelsen, I need a few more days to collect my thoughts, playing it reminded me of all the wonderful medieval fantasy JRPGs that I've played over the past several years. And so in this video, I compiled 10 of my favorite medieval fantasy JRPGs that you probably played yourself. And if not, I hope you take the time to play them yourself. And as always, 10 games don't encompass the breadth and scope of the entirety of medieval fantasy themed JRPGs. So if you've got a game that you want to recommend that has this theme, please post them in the comments below and let's talk about it. Okay, let's check out my picks. Across the entirety of the Fire Emblem franchise, swords and sorcery have always played a pivotal role in establishing the series' identity. However, I feel that it's Path of Radiance that most strongly gets this across. The story kicks off with our protagonist Ike, who is suddenly thrusted into the role of leading the Grail Mercenaries, a ragtag group of warriors who are struggling to get by. As the game progresses, we see Ike grow into a fine leader and eventually transform his small group into a force to be reckoned with, one that will eventually aid in battles that'll determine the fate of the entire kingdom. This sense of growth is something that you'll actively feel in its gameplay as you play through the game, recruiting units and leveling each of them up. Ike's upward trajectory as a character in the narrative neatly maps along with your own journey as a player as well. By the end of the game, Ike will be a ton more confident with how he guides his troops in the battle, while you'll also flex your honed skills and show a far better mastery of the game by this point, feeling like you can take on anything. Path of Radiance is widely celebrated to be one of the best in the series, and it's not hard to see why. The excellent narrative, great characters, and fun strategic battles all come together to make it a standout entry. I remember playing Shining Force 2 with my wife a couple of years ago, and I was just astonished by how well this game aged. This is one of those tactical games that don't go into the minutia of battle, meaning you don't have to go into the minutia of where your character's facing, for example, and digging deep into what's really important in tactical RPGs, which is its progression and its positional gameplay. And before you say anything else, yes, Shining Force 2 does have a wonderful medieval fantasy setting where you not only do battles in your typical battlefields and such, but also on the world map as well. Shining Force 2 is undoubtedly one of the progenitors of many tactical RPGs that we've come to know and love to this day. And if you haven't played any of the Shining Force games at all, there's a ton of Sega Genesis collections out there that'll have both games for you to be able to play. And with its colorful graphics, slightly off-kilter localization, and as well as easy-to-learn gameplay but difficult to master, these games are a must-play for any tactical RPG fan. While knights in armor brandishing cool swords is definitely a key element in the identity of many medieval games, we can't forget the political side of things as well. Admittedly, it's a type of storytelling that isn't everyone's cup of tea. Heck, I'd say it's not mine most of the time either. That said, Triangle Strategy managed to pull it off and envelop me into its politically charged narrative by raising the stakes and giving us some choice moments where we literally choose the fate of everyone around us. The game follows Saranoa Wolfort, the leader of House Wolfort, which is an army force situated dead center between the three nations of Glenbrook, Esfrost, and Hyzant. You can even say that you're in the middle of this triangle, but I digress. Depending on the decisions you make in the story, Saranoa can shift between these nations, thus altering the course of the narrative and see firsthand the consequences of these actions in relation to these kingdoms and the characters within his house. Despite how dry political drama can be, having this much influence over the story is a big part of what makes it engaging, and is especially fun when playing it together with friends and comparing who did what for certain dialogue choices. Beyond the story though, the tactical gameplay is also very streamlined, fun, and a great entry point for those who have little experience in the genre. While politics may not necessarily be the first thing someone thinks of when it comes to medieval games, Triangle Strategy is a good reminder that not only can they absolutely be a critical part of the experience, 
but one that is enriching and elevates the game into something truly impressive. Speaking of political, you can't get any more political than Tactics Ogre Reborn, which is yes, it is set in medieval fantasy settings, but it's so deep and it's so brutal that I just have to add that this was made in the 90s. Tactics Ogre Reborn is probably one of the most difficult tactical RPGs I've played over the past several years, but it's also the most rewarding in that it's got some really deep interconnecting systems that were just not present in the original game or its previous re-releases. In fact, this game has been re-released three times, not including the original SNES release. And in terms of its narrative, it's got some really deep characters that grow throughout the story, whether for good or for ill. And unlike Shining Force 2, which I mentioned earlier, Tactics Ogre Reborn is filled with detail and minutia that gameplay lovers will absolutely embrace and fall in love with. But that also means that it has one of the highest learning curves in every single game on this list. But for those patient enough to learn its systems, and for anyone who has a hankering for a dark political storyline, Tactics Ogre Reborn will be a match made in heaven for you. The thing is with Tactics Ogre Reborn is it was made by one Yasumi Matsuno, who is one of my favorite game designers of all time, and Vagrant Story, which is the next game we're about to talk about, is yet another one of his classics. Set in Leamon, which is this awesome medieval city that is just filled and teeming with mysteries, Vagrant Story casts you as one Ashley Riot. Yes, I still can't get over that name many decades later, as he's trying to chase one Sidney Lostero and unravel a mystery that he's trying to uncover. I also want to add that Vagrant Story comes from a long line of Square Enix titles that are trying to help turn-based fans transition to other genres of games. And it's because of that that Vagrant Story has a hybrid real-time system mixed with turn-based that allows you to target different body parts while steadily increasing the risk of things happening like weapon breaking and such. And while some might say that Vagrant Story is a lot more difficult to learn than Tactics Ogre Reborn, I actually felt that Vagrant Story systems were a bit easier, but a tiny bit easier to learn than Tactics Ogre Reborn. Nevertheless, Vagrant Story is an impressive feat, whose unique look and feel still feels great several decades after its original release. It's a kind of dungeon crawler that you just don't see these days, filled with super deep gameplay that only a few have mastered and really enjoy. In fact, it's one of those few games that we haven't even seen a remaster or a re-release since. So Square Enix, if you want to remaster or remake a game, we would absolutely love to see Vagrant Story again in this day and age. The Tales series has dabbled in different types of settings, though it was the very first title that arguably leaned the most into that classic fantasy JRPG aesthetic that we all know and love. From its fantastical world to the classic party makeup of a swordsman, archer, healer, and magic user, Everything in Tales of Fantasia comes together to establish a feeling of going on a grand journey. This epic and foundational action RPG sees our ragtag group of adventurers go on a quest across the land, delving into dungeons and fighting monsters, all the while obtaining golden loot. On that topic, a fun fact about its action-based combat and general approach to the world and gameplay is that it was born from a desire to combine a fighting game like Street Fighter 2 with the tone and feel of exploration and adventure-heavy RPGs such as Dragon Quest and Final Fantasy. Considering this was one of the very first games of its kind, it's crazy to think that Tales of Fantasia played a huge part in shaping action RPGs as we see it today. While there are definitely newer games in the series that play better and tell more engrossing narratives, few of the other entries have ever captured the same sense of whimsical fantasy that was lovingly crafted into this debut title. Whenever I think about Final Fantasy IV, the sentiment that comes to mind is that it is the quintessential classic fantasy JRPG. While there are many entries in the franchise that dabble in different genres, such as steampunk, contemporary, or even full-blown science fiction, the series started predominantly as one inspired by Dungeons & Dragons. But arguably, it was Final Fantasy IV that epitomized this, despite the higher technology leanings later in the story. Starring the Dark Knight Cecil, he and his companions journey across the land, fighting goblins, ogres, and dragons, 
all the while trying to redeem himself from taking of his Blade of Darkness. Unlike most Final Fantasy titles at the time, which allowed your characters to switch around jobs willy-nilly, part of what made the characters of Final Fantasy IV resonate so much is that their jobs helped define who they were. Cecil's vocation as a Dark Knight actually mattered in the story, and became a defining element in his character arc, making his growth easy to empathize with and visualize. With that in mind, it also had a big effect on gameplay, since different parts of the story would frequently change your party makeup. The challenge of each section in the game was to make use of who you had. Sometimes you would have a balanced party that covered all your bases. Other times, you'd be lacking in certain party members and had to be clever about how to make up for the weaknesses in the lineup. The perfect synergy between narrative and gameplay is just a smaller part of a larger whole as to why Final Fantasy IV is reflected on as one of the most beloved entries in the franchise. The PS1 was truly a powerhouse when it came to high-quality JRPGs, and Legend of Dragoon is a shining example of that. The main character is a swordsman named Dart, who awakens to his power as a dragoon. This allows him to transform into a wickedly cool suit of armor, which grants him the power of the red-eyed flame dragon. The game begins with Dart coming back from a journey, only to find his village burnt to the ground. Understandably vowing rage, he tracks down those responsible, kicking off the story in earnest. Despite the somewhat been-there-and-done-that type of intro, the rest of the adventure proves to be much more than a simple revenge plot, as we learn more about Dart, his eventual companions, and the nature of the world itself. Something that truly set this game apart from nearly all of its contemporaries, however, was its battle system. Rather than simply making decisions in the menu, each melee attack requires precise timing in order to do the maximum amount of damage. While the early game attacks aren't too tough to pull off, some of the later abilities you learn can be pretty challenging to get the timing down. The combination of this and the ability to transform your characters into the titular Dragoons make this one of the most fun turn-based JRPGs of its era, one that holds up remarkably well to this day. If we had a Final Fantasy game on this list, then it stands to reason that Dragon Quest should be on this list as well. And for that, I'm going to be talking about Dragon Quest XI. As a modern Dragon Quest, this captured everything that I knew and loved about Dragon Quest over the past several decades, and it is the perfect culmination of what Dragon Quest is in the modern era. Visually, this game is just stunning, and retaining its classic turn-based gameplay that I've always loved. But with a lot of modern conveniences like modern storytelling, modern character development, you name it, I absolutely had a blast playing this game from beginning to end. And it's also very cozy because everything is so familiar too. It also introduced me to one of my favorite RPG characters of all time in Silvando. And when the game got re-released as Dragon Quest XI-S, you bet that I was willing to play through the game all over again from beginning to end. And let's not forget that XI-S also allows you to play it in the classic pixel style as well, which is so cool. You can tell that this game was made with a lot of love. So if you've got the time, I highly recommend checking out Dragon Quest XI. I wanted to end this list with something that was recently released, and of course the very first game that comes to mind is Unicorn Overlord. And yes, I can finally pronounce the name of the dang game, okay? <laughs> Unicorn Overlord is the result of taking inspiration from classic ogre battle games with the beautiful artwork that Vanillaware is known for. And keep in mind that up until this point, Vanillaware has only released five games in the West, and those games have showed that Vanillaware is a master of visual and sound design. When I heard that Vanillaware was making a full-on RPG, I got really excited, and the more we learned of Unicorn Overlord, the more that I got really obsessed with how this game would play. And when I finally got in my hands and started playing it, I just fell in love with it. Its characters, its story, even though it's plain, and all of the wonderful things that you can do in the game. Like it's got some really basic city building mechanics that make stationing guards in every single town that you've liberated worth doing. And can I be honest? I am still playing through Unicorn Overlord a second time around. That's how amazing this game is to me. And if you haven't played it yet, I urge you to play its generous demo that allows you to play it for like at least six hours and be able to carry the save to the full game. 
I promise that you won't be disappointed. And that, my friends, are 10 medieval fantasy-themed JRPGs that I played over the past several years. Now, as I said in the beginning, these 10 don't encompass everyone's favorites because, you know, it's just 10 games. So I want to hear what you would vote for in your top 10 list. Post your thoughts in the comments below and let's talk about it. Thank you very much for watching, everyone, and I'll see you in the next video.